Today we will be talking about glandular tissue. During your extra oral exam, there are many glands of the head and neck that we palpate and observe. What are we looking for when we examine the glands? Remember we're looking for symmetry and we should not be finding any nodes and so forth. And if we do, we obviously want to ask further questions and document. The glandular tissues we will be talking about today are the salivary glands, thyroid and parathyroid, thymus and lacrimal. Just to give you a little bit of background, a gland is a structure that produces a chemical secretion necessary for normal body function. Exocrine has a duct that exits the gland and brings it the secretion to the area in which it's needed. Endocrine has no duct. The secretion is released directly into the bloodstream. The salivary and lacrimal glands, both major and minor salivary glands, are exocrine, gland, exocrine glands. These have ducts, while the thyroid, parathyroid, and thymus are endocrine. These are ductless. So we talk about saliva. It's a clear fluid secreted by exocrine exocrine glands located in the head and neck which empty into the oral cavity. The cells secrete water, electrolytes, mucus, and enzymes. The cellular makeup you talk about more in histology. Fluids flow into collecting ducts and the composition of the secretion is altered within each duct. We talk about the composition of saliva, 99, over 99 percent of saliva is water. Then there's some inorganic components such as bicarbonate which makes the saliva alkaline. Potassium, calcium, these play a role in calculus formation and it provides a buffer from plaque acids. There's organic components such as the protein carbohydrate complex called mucin which is found in mucus, suspended material epithelial cells and also enzymes amylase which is the enzyme which breaks down the starch molecules into simpler carbohydrates. Amylase begins the digestive process and back to the mucin, high amounts of mucin again which are found in mucus tend to favor calculus formation. Salivary flow rate. Secretion of, sal of saliva is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nerves from brain to gland come from the parasympathetic divisions only. I always think of parasympathetic para as a helper. Parasympathetic division are the rest in, and digest system, which conserves energy as it, as it slows the heart rate and increases intestinal and glandular activity. So these nerves control the volume and type of saliva that's secreted. You'll find that different glands secrete different types of saliva. Various sources can stimulate salivary flow Think about when you smell something, smell food, you may get a, a higher flow of saliva. Flow decreases during sleep. When we talk about the pH of saliva, which its normal range is 6.5 to 7.4, which is neutral, we're talking about no food. This is saliva when there is no food present. With increase of saliva, which is during and after eating, the pH becomes more basic, more alkaline. Alkalinity buffers acidic pH of plaque. 
There are types of secretions. There are two different types. The serous cells, which secrete very thin watery secretion, which contains the amylase, which starts the digestive process, and mucus, which secretes a thick ropey secretion with high amounts of mucin. I always think about that over the counter drug Mucinex, trying to get rid of some of that mucus. And some glands have only one type, and, some, and one, the submandibular gland, is mixed, has both serous and mucus secretions. What are some of the functions of saliva? It maintains the body's water balance. During swallowing, the saliva binds the chew food, chewed foods into the bolus. It protects tissue from being irritated by food. It acts as a lubricant. It protects the oral mucosa. Taste, the molecules in food have to be solu solubilized <laughs> to be tasted. So they have to be broken down. Other functions protects the teeth. It's a source of minerals for remineralization. It's a source of fluoride also for remineralization. It helps to, to cleanse the teeth. Lysozyme is an enzyme that lyses. Lysis means it's the destruction of cells by the disruption of the bounding membrane membrane, allowing cell contents to escape. So this lysozyme allows the cells to escape, prevents overgrowth of bacteria. Again, it initiates starch digestion. Remember, think about the amylase. Properties of saliva include all of the following except one. Which one is it? If you answered B, mastication, you are correct. Xerostomia, also known as dry mouth. Remember, salivary flow decreases with age. So dry mouth is a decrease in the rate of salivary flow. When patients suffer from this dry mouth, certain things increase, such as caries rate, oral hygiene, it's not as good. Remember, you don't have that self-cleansing. Halitosis, or bad breath, and oral ulcerations and infections. So if you have a patient with xerostomia, think about what type of recommendations you would make to your patient. Would you recommend an alcohol-based mouth rinse? No, that would exacerbate the drying. So you'd want to have perhaps more frequent recall appointments, drink more water, perhaps even a, a, a saliva replacement agent. So medical histories that you may see related to a decrease in the, in the salivary gland function would be chronic sinusitis. That's because of the antihistamines that are taken. Very drying. Current chemotherapy, depression and hypertension. The reason for the decrease in the, in the salivary flow is because of the medication. Diabetes, head and neck radiation, recurrent oral candidiasis, thrush, and rheumatoid arthritis are some of them. Some of the complaints you may hear a patient mention, sore or burning sensation in the mouth, may feel like there's sand in their eyes, always want to suck on candies. Of course, this is an area that you'd want to talk about sugarless candy need to sip water throughout the day and night, difficulty speaking for more than 10 minutes without taking a sip of water, and difficulty swallowing foods without the aid of water. So some questions you can ask would be, you know, those are basically related on related to their complaints. Do you sip liquids? 
Does your mouth feel dry when eating a meal? Do you have difficulty swallowing foods? Does the amount of saliva in your mouth seem to be too little, too much? Or is it unnoticeable? So what might you find what might you find intraorally? Now we've already talked about that you may have an increased caries rate. That would be especially on the cervical and, and incisal areas. Poor oral hygiene, periodontal problems, halitosis. But you may find when you're working on the patient that your dental mirror sticks to the, the buccal mucosa. You may also see frothy saliva, which is thick and bubbly, but little or no serous component. Remember the serous component is the watery component. You will not see pooling of saliva in the anterior floor of mouth. You may find oral candidiasis. And there may also be glossitis, which is a, de a decreased filiform papilla, a decrease in that papilla. When you see somebody with mouth breathing, note how smooth and glossy the appearance of the gingival margin is. Can you think of some cues to know that somebody is a mouth breather? Remember when we are doing an extra oral exam, one of the things we want to see is that the lips are together at rest. If they are not, this may be an indication that they are a mouth breather. Okay, which of the following dental management methods is best for patients with decreased salivary production? If you answer D, you would be correct. You want to do a more frequent supportive care interval. If somebody has de decreased salivary production, do you think that you would recommend a great Mexican restaurant to this patient? Probably not due to the spiciness of the foods. Okay, when we talk about ma major salivary glands, remember these are exocrine glands. We're going to be talking about the parotid, which is we palpate during the extra oral exam. Submandibular, remember when we look at the inferior, we feel the angle of the mandible, that inferior border, and we feel for that notch. And that's the landmark where we'll find the submandibular gland. And also the sublingual gland, which is really palpated interorally. Again, I mentioned already, they have ducts. And the flow is stimulated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Let's talk about the parotid gland. This is the largest gland. It protrudes around the lateral aspect of the ramus and partially overlaps the masseter muscle. Stenson's duct, it crosses the masseter and buccal fold and pierces the buccinator muscle and opens into the oral cavity opposite the maxillary first and second molars at the parotid papilla. Keep in mind that the facial nerve does not innervate the parotid gland. However, the nerve is in, enmeshed within this gland. So damage to the gland can damage the facial nerve. Remember, the facial nerve is a very superficial nerve. Parotid gland, again, stenson duct. I've already talked about that it pierces the buccinator. The secretion type is serous. Although this is the largest gland, it only produces 25% of total saliva. And remember again that the secretion type is serous, which contains amylase to break down starches. The innervation of the parotid gland, the autonomic efferent, causes the saliva to flow, is the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is cranial nerve number nine, and general afferent for the general sensation is the auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. Again, we'll be talking about the trigeminal nerve very soon. 
couple of lectures from now. Note by the parotid papilla you can see four dice granules which are just trapped sebaceous glands. I didn't want to do that. You may want to. The mumps is an acute viral illness caused by the mumps virus. It usually starts on one side and then moves to the to the other. The parotid salivary glands are the most frequently affected. Symptoms are fever, headache, muscle aches, tiredness, loss of appetite, and again then it's followed by the swelling of the salivary glands. We don't see this very often due to immunization. Think about your extraoral and interoral examination. It's with a parotid gland is, you can do bimanual palpitation, and you also want to check the flow at the parotid papilla. So just to review, parotid gland produces 25% of the total saliva. Stenson duct, Stenson's duct empties opposite the maxillary molars. It's serous secretion only. It's located in front of and below the ears. Parasympathetic innervation is by cranial nerve number 9. Glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay, let's talk about the submandibular gland. This is located inferior, anterior, and medial to the angle of the mandible. Remember that notch right anterior to the angle of the mandible. And then you're going to go medial to that. Most of this gland is superficial to the mylohyoid muscle. Remember the mylohyoid muscle forms the floor of the mouth. A small portion wraps around the mylohyoid muscle. Great picture, huh? The Wharton's duct is the excretory duct for the submandibular gland. The mnemonic I use is submarines go to war. Submandibular gland goes to Wharton's duct. This run, runs upward and forward from the gland. It really has a quite a ways to travel and it's an upward battle. It opens into the mouth at the sublingual caruncle. Right here. Secretion type is mixed. This provides the largest amount of saliva. It provides 65% of the saliva. This gland is the one that gets shut down due to medication. Also, when you're providing treatment for your patient, this is the gland that you may get hosed down from this duct. It comes flying at you. The innervation of the submandibular gland, the autonomic. Efferent is the coda tympani nerve, which is a branch of the facial nerve. Its general afferent is the lingual nerve. The lingual nerve is, this is if you touch your chin, the lingual nerve is telling your brain. So the lingual nerve is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. Remember I mentioned that the Wharton's duct, this duct has an uphill travel. So oftentimes calculus can form in this duct, forming a stone. Stones are, are commonly, most commonly found in the submandibular gland. They are also called silolith, siloliths. Mm -hmm. They're usually removed in the office with topical anesthesia. Usually the duct, the duct is incised over the calculus which is then extracted. Calculi that are in the 
in the substance of the gland require resection of the gland through external incision. So this is why it's important to palpate if you find any hard substances or a decrease in saliva, it could be due to a stone. Here's just a picture of the stones. The stones in this gland tend to be single and within the duct, whereas the parotid, when they have stones, they're usually smaller, multiple, and within the body of the gland. Clinically, somebody who's experiencing a submandibular stone, patients will complain of pain and swelling associated with eating. Think about your salivary flow changes with eating, it increases. Sometimes swelling is the only presentation. These stones can be palpated. Sometimes they can actually be milked out of the orifices of the major ducts, depending on the size, if it's really small. This is something I would have the, the dentist do. Smaller stones within the duct itself, again, can be milked out. They can also be palpated within the minor salivary gland ducts. If a stone cannot be palpated, an occlusal or panoramic radiograph should be of assistance in identifying its location. So again, if you find that there's a decrease in salivary flow, a patient is complaining of discomfort, swelling, you may not be able to palpate it. You may need a radiograph to assist you. Okay, so here is your extraoral and intraoral exam. of the submandibular gland. So if we were to review, produces 65% of the total saliva, Wharton's duct empties under the tongue. This is mixed secretion, mostly serous. It's located near the angle body of the mandible and the parasympathetic innervation by cranial nerve 7. When we talk about the sublingual gland, this is something you'll feel more inside of the mouth. This is located beneath the mucous membrane in the floor of the mouth. It rests on the superior portion, so the top of the mylohyoid muscle. It sits in the sublingual fossa of the mandible. It helps to form the sublingual fold. This may be more noticeable when there is a loss of mandibular teeth. So here's just showing you swelling of the sublingual gland. And notice how it's very noticeable in these edentulous areas. Okay, again, sublingual gland has excretory ducts. The ducts of Ravinus empty into the sublingual fold, which has one major duct known as Bartholin's, Bartholin's duct, which opens into the sublingual caruncle beside Wharton's duct. The secretion is mostly mucus. Sublingual gland produces only 10% of the total saliva production. And this secretion type, which is mostly mucus, is used for lubrication. Innervation of the sublingual gland. Autonomic efferent is the quarter tympani nerve, which is a branch of the facial nerve. And general afferent is the lingual nerve, again, which is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. So if we were to review sublingual gland, it produces only 10% of saliva. Ducts of ravinus, which are 8 to 20 small duct openings along the sublingual fold. Produces a mixed secretion, mostly mucus, which helps to lubricate the mouth. It's lo located in the floor of the mouth near the midline, and the parasympathetic innervation is by the cranial nerve 7 facial nerve. Here it just gives a, a diagram of where the submandibular salivary gland, sublingual, parotid, 
notice its proximity. It lies partially on the masseter muscle, but the parotid duct or Stenson duct pierces the buccinator muscle. You may want to take a minute to look at this and determine what, what number one is, that duct there, two is a gland, three a muscle, four duct, five gland, and six is a gland. And there are your answers. Let's talk a little bit about minor salivary glands. They're similar in structure to the major, major glands, but they're much smaller in size. They're only two to five millimeters. Each gland has its own duct opening. So again, it's an exocrine gland. However, these ducts are so small that they're, they're, they're nameless. The secretions for the minor salivary glands are either serous or mucus with one type predominating. The function is it secretes small, small amounts of saliva to keep the mucosa moist. For the palatine glands, these cover the posterior of the hard palate and all of the soft palate. If you take a two by two and dry off the, the palate a bit and then take a look, you're going to see little droplets of saliva. Those are where your palatine glands are. These extend down to the retromolar area. Nicotina stomatitis, this is a smoker, and what happens is it irritates the palatine glands. Certainly noteworthy. The lingual glands are divided into three groups. Anterior lingual, which are located on the ventral surface of the tongue. Von Ebner's, we've talked about Von Ebner's before, are located in the groove around the circumvallate papilla. And posterior lingual, which are located around the lingual tonsils of the tongue. Okay, here's your question. Which of the following glands lies immediately inferior to the circumvallate papilla? If you answered B, you're correct. Labial buccal glands. These are located under the mucosa on the inner surfaces of the lip and cheek. Remember, this is something that we want to palpate. And it should feel like oatmeal when you're palpating it. Every time I move my, you see them right here? Mucoseals, you'll talk about a little bit more next, actually, third semester in oral pathology. But this is due to trauma to the, to the duct. There'll be a pooling of saliva in the tissue surrounding the minor salivary glands. And this can change in size. And if you look right here, there's the traumatic lesion. Let's talk about the thyroid gland. When somebody goes to have their thyroid checked, not just at their primary care physician, but if they need to see a specialist, they see an endocrinologist. That's because this is an endocrine gland, which means it secretes the hormone directly into the bloodstream. There is no duct. The thyroid gland we've talked about and we've palpated the extra oral exam. It's located in the anterior of the neck, inferior to the thyroid cartilage. Remember the thyroid cartilage is the Adam's apple. And then if you go inferior to that, about two centimeters, you should find it. It contains two lobes which are connected by the isthmus. It secretes a hormone called thyroxine, which requires iodine to elaborate. A goiter is an enlargement of the gland. A goiter can happen with hypo or hyperthyroidism. There are numerous pathological causes. Most common worldwide cause is a dietary deficiency of iodine. Remember that a goiter takes years to manifest and the most common cause is an increase in the thyroid stimulating 
hormone, pituitary thyrotrophic hormone, which is produced by the pituitary gland. Again, if you see a very large in third world countries, it's due to a deficiency in iodine. Functions of the thyroid hormone. This increases the rate of metabolism. It regulates protein, fat, and carbohydrates. It maintains normal growth and development, affects body temperature, influences cardiac, cardiac output, influences muscle tone. You've probably heard of hyperthyroidism, which is an increase in the activity of the thyroid gland. Secretions of thyroxin is increased, as is the metabo metabolic processes. Patient will have experienced usually weight loss, nervousness, tremors. In hypothyroidism, there's a decreased activity in thyroid gland, characterized by weight gain and mental and physical lethargy, may also be dryness of skin. Here's your thyroid and in the middle is the isthmus. Here are some pictures of goiters. Obviously, I am showing some rather large ones that you're not going to see. But here's an increase right here. Here's a goiter right there and a goiter right there. Again, these take years to manifest. So when you are palpating the thyroid during your extra oral exam, you want to Watch for movement of the thyroid cartilage as patient swallows water. And again, you palpate slightly below the thyroid cartilage, the Adam's apple. It's just going to feel like a soft, fleshy area unless you find nodes. Don't be too concerned if you really can't feel a well-defined gland. Oftentimes, all you're going to feel is a fleshy type area. Okay, which of these pictures is an enlarged thyroid? Unfortunately, when you're working with the patient, you're not going to have arrows pointing to where your thyroid is. But if you, so this picture right here, you are correct. And remember that many enlargements are not this obvious. You need to visualize the thyroid as well as palpate, and this is a normal thyroid. See the symmetry? So then you have your parathyroid glands, which are located on the posterior surface of the thyroid gland. They consist of four small glands. These are endocrine glands, which mean they're ductless. They secrete parathyroid hormone, which helps to regulate calcium and phosphorus levels of the blood. This regulates the absorption of calcium storage and removal of calcium from bones, and the excretion of calcium. It's just a nice picture of it. Then we talk about the thymus gland, which decreases in size as one ages. It's located beneath the upper end of the sternum and lower anterior region of the neck. This produces T cells of the immune system and then they migrate to lymph nodes in the spleen. There's your thymus. So this cannot be palpated because it's beneath the sternum. Let's talk about the lacrimal glands. Location is the upper outer corner of the eye where the lacrimal fossa is of the frontal bone. Lacrimal fluid lubricates the conjunctiva, which is the lining of the inside of the eyelids and the front of the eyeball. The fluid leaves the gland through 8 to 12 fine tubules. After passing over the eyeball, the lacrimal fluid is drained through a small hole in each eyelid, ending in the nasal lacrimal sac, which is a thin walled structure behind the medial canthus. From the nasal lacrimal, lacrimal sac, the lacrimal fluid continues into the nasolacrimal duct, 
duct, ultimately draining into the inferior nasal meatus. This is why when you cry, you, it's accompanied by a runny nose. Its innervation is parasympathetic fibers of the greater petrosal nerve, which is a branch of the facial or seventh cranial nerve, and the lacrimal nerves. The lacrimal nerve serves as an afferent nerve to the lacrimal gland. So remember, lacrimal fluid is important because it lubricates the eyeball. This patient presents with an asymptomatic slow-growing mass in the parotid area. We don't know that it's benign, but because of tests, we know that this is benign. Despite this tumor being benign, there may be morbidity because of the intimate association of the facial nerve in the parotid. Nonetheless, the treatment is surgical removal, which usually includes the lobe in which the tumor is arising. This mass has been present for about five years. A ranula, again you'll be learning more about this in pathology, but this involves the major salivary glands. There's a blockage of the drainage, so again, this will change in size depending on the salivary flow. And this is usually a blockage due to a stone. Here's just a diagram that you may want to take a look at. Try to identify these areas. Remember I mentioned that the parotid gland is not innervated by the facial nerve, however, the facial nerve runs through the parotid gland. And if there's damage to the parotid gland, there could be damage to the facial nerve. Here are just your answers. Now based on what we did today, you may want to take a look at the case studies which are in your learning for your learning activity. Thank you.